awesome to welcome Tulane head coach Lisa Stockton to the basketball podcast. Lisa, the all-time winningest women's basketball coach in the state of Louisiana and newest inductee into the Conference USA Hall of Fame, will wrap up her third decade at the helm of the Green Waves women's basketball program during the 2023-24 season. Stockton was named Tulane's sixth head basketball coach in 1994. Stockton has an overall head coaching record of 624 and 335. She's been named Louisiana Coach of the Year twice and Conference USA Coach of the Year twice. Stockton has led Tulane to 21 postseason appearances while averaging 20 wins a season. She has also helped secure five conference tournament titles and four regular season conference titles. While leading the Green Wave, Stockton has mentored six All-Americans and five WNBA draft picks. Coach Stockton, welcome to the podcast. Oh, I'm so glad to be on. I, I, as I was saying, I, I love to hear your podcast and we listen to it. My staff and I listen to it all the time. Well, wonderful to hear that and grateful to have you on. And uh, Coach, what a career. 30 years going on well, longer than that, but 30 years as a head coach. Yeah, it's uh, 30 years at Tulane. It's really, it's incredible to to kind of think, where's that time gone? You know, when it seems like just yesterday when I, I came to New Orleans for the first time and, you know, it's it's been fun. It's been a great journey. Talk to us a little bit about that process to obviously to be successful over 30 years and maintain a job at one place means you've done some things right. In addition to that, I'm imagining you've adapted a lot. So talk to us about those two things. Well, I, I think first, you know, coming to Tulane, it was an amazing opportunity for me as from an assistant coach at Georgia Tech. And, you know, you come here and, and we were able to have some success early, uh, which certainly helped. But, you know, I, I think looking back on it, I think the great thing is, is, um, you know, I never planned to be here that long, but I also didn't plan to be someplace else. And so, you know, when you, you know, just coach each season, like it's you're the only season in front of you, I think that's really important. And I think over those years, what's been so great is just kind of finding my fit. You know, I think when, when people ask me, what's my best advice for young coaches? I think one is, you know, not, not panicking for every little thing that happens, but the other is, Find the fit, find the fit of student athletes that fit you and find the fit of a university that fits you. And and hopefully most people can have the kind of support I've had at Tulane. I've had great support here. Yeah, no doubt. Great support. And, uh, you know, you've been adaptable. So give us a perspective, you know, of the different. Let's talk about offense, maybe some of the different styles of offense you've run over the 30 years at Tulane. Yeah, you know, I look back, you know, my early years here, we had some really good post players. You know, I, I started in, I had Barbara Ferris, who played the WNBA for many, many years. And we recruited a player named Janelle Burst, and we had Tina McKeever, all of those play the WNBA. We were able to to get that that dominant post player. And, you know, we ran a triangle offense. We did, you know, a little bit like the Bulls and all that. We ran some of that. We ran a lot of high lows. We, you know, just really put that ball inside a lot. Now, I've had some good shooters along the way, but it's been a real balance of that inside and outside game in those early years. And I look in um, even 2010, we had some injuries to our post players. And so... That's the first time we really even looked at the dribble drive, you know, spread it out, get to the basket. I had mostly guards and, you know, we've run that to where we pressed. So we always say either we scored or we we gave up a rebound. You know, it was like one of those kind of years, but we won a championship in 2010 playing that way. And then, you know, we we evolved to to kind of change with our personnel and change with the people that we can recruit here. Well, and personnel is changing a little bit because of how they're being brought up in the game as well. And that's part of it. And that leads us to kind of the main topic today, which is space, pace and flow. So talk to us a little bit about that philosophy that you're playing with now. Well, I mean, I think you you try to evolve with the game. You know, you look at not just the NBA, but just how the players are being taught. You, you thought about that. We have post players. When we talk about my early years, those post players didn't shoot the three. You know, it wasn't something they, they were 15 foot range and in and you know, now you can look at fours and fives that you can stretch and, and can shoot outside and that spreads it out. Obviously, the, the three-point shot has changed a lot in the game, just the value of that three-point shot. And, you know, I, I think that's that's really made you think twice about, you know, your possessions and what's a good shot and what's not. And, you know, we, we really talk about, you know, first is just if we get that rebound, let's get out and run. Let's get out and spread the lanes and run and try to get a good shot early you know, with possession of the ball and then, you know, getting that space to where if they take away that three, can you get to the rim? Can you find a really good shot in that first seven, eight, nine, ten 10 seconds? Can you do that early? 
And, and the other thing that we're probably putting more concentration on this year is can you go from that philosophy into something um, that flows into an offense that you can get a good look in? Well, I love that. I look forward to watching that. And maybe let's start with discussing what I would consider some principles of play, one of them being advantage-based basketball. And you break it down into three offensive situations that you've highlighted, advantage, neutral, and disadvantage. Can you explain how these situations impact your offensive strategy and decision-making on the court? Well, I mean, I think, you know, just trying to get in a situation where someone's got to make a decision, trying to force the defense to uh, guard the ball coming at the basket and trying to make a decision on how they're going to come out and, and close out on an outside shooter. I think one of the most difficult things is, you know, trying to get your players to trust that space is, is to get out and, and trust that don't run to the ball, don't necessarily cut to the ball, just trying to keep that space a little bit because, you know, that way you, you, you can find the best shot because you're either going to try to take that layup or try to get to the rim, you know, or try to, you know, we always talk about one more, you know, make a pass, make another pass to try to get a, a good shot. And, you know, I think charting things is something that we really try to do a lot of and and we we give stats and practice and we chart that and, you know, really try to give them statistics to go, you're shooting this, this from this shot, you're shooting that from that shot. And, you know, I think trying to educate them along, along the way is, is hugely important. Well, and you mentioned one of the impetuses behind a lot of this for you was you did a study yourself. I think you mentioned it was in 2010. Can you talk about that study and some of the learnings that kind of came from that? Well, we were kind of forced into it. You know, I think it was one of those situations that we had a couple of injuries really early and, you know, that's something I, you know, I did learn that year is that you know, don't be afraid to change what you do, depending on what happens to you. You know, it could happen in injuries, it, you know, it could happen just in, in a certain recruiting year, but we really had some very good guards and we were really thin at the post. And we had a very good, Brett Benzio was a very good, she was a thousand points and a thousand rebounds, post player for us, but we really had very young players behind that. So we really changed it to where our four player was five, eight. You know, we, we were very small. Uh, we doubled the ball. We did things defensively. We really pressured the ball. But, you know, offensively, you know, we just tried to spread it out and drive to the basket and kick. And, and that's really the first exposure I'd had to like a dribble drive type philosophy. And again, that was out of necessity. And, you know, my associate head coach who's been with me 18 years, Alan Fry, does a, a, a tremendous job, I think, of bringing things to the table. And, you know, we really thought a lot about how can we play? How can we win with this group? How can we have our best players on the court? And that's probably what got us there is to change what we're doing and not put our best players on the bench. And so when we did that, I think the great thing is the players had fun with it. You know, we pressed, we tried to get steals. We really were aggressive on defense, but, you know, we, we put people in positions to succeed offensively and, you know, we broke some records. We had some three point records. We had some players get to the free throw line a lot and we played hard. You know, that's probably the thing I, I would say that strikes me the most. I have uh, friends here that say that was our favorite, the favorite team they could watch because um, we got up and down the floor and put up points. But, you know, I think when the players bought into that and they realized what we were doing, we progressed, you know, we, we won the conference tournament, you know, we got the NCAA tournament that year. And, you know, when you look at it, like it was really because of a change we made and a buy-in that the players made. It sounds fun. And uh, obviously you're continuing this a little bit. And uh, another principle play that kind of you play with is obviously spacing. You've mentioned it a few times already. One of the phrasings that I love that you use is stretching the defense. Can you talk about that aspect of it? How are you stretching the defense? Well, we talk about even, you know, make or miss, you know, on defense, trying to try to go make or miss, you know, where we're going to fill, you know, we try to hit those corners and we try to really get as wide as we can you know, if our, our point guard and, and right now we're, you know, we really are kind of moving our point guard around to see, you know, what our best fit is, but, you know, our point guard has that ability to, you know, if they're that wide, can she get to the rim? Can she drive to the rim? I mean, probably not very often, but, you know, if she really pushes that ball and creates, you talk about an advantage situation, gets by her player and creates something there. I think just keeping that ball moving, you know, we talk about not letting the ball stick, you know, can you keep that ball moving around? And and I tell them like, I'm okay if we don't run an offense, you know, just try to get that ball um, moving. And, you know, the thing you have to commit to, uh, I think in any kind of, any kind of change like that is 
skill development. You know, we that doesn't just happen naturally. I think I think right now a lot of kids come out of high school over dribble. And, you know, the three-pointer has to be something you really commit to practicing. Uh, you can become a much better shooter if you get a lot of shots up. And, you know, so again, trying to create that space by trying to push to the rim and trying to find people, but give people a shot, a pass they can shoot off of. If they're guarded, can they go one more? And you know, passing, if you gave me one thing, I think passing is a lost art. Really trying to get people to not just get the ball to somebody, but pass the ball in a position that they can do something with it. I imagine when you're saying that, what you really mean is decision making off the yeah. pass. Yeah. And that's definitely something that I think is, uh, is, is a little bit lacking in terms of the modern game. But spacing makes it easier to become a better decision maker, doesn't it? It does, because I think your reads are easier. You know, when, when you have that space, you can see your reads a little bit easier. And, you know, that that helps. And, you, you know, put it in practice. I know you talk about it a lot, putting things in practice to make decision making. And we try to put things that look like our offenses, you know, things that look a little bit what like what they'll see and do it. And, you know, it might be just three on three, things like that, that are that are getting them make decisions. And it does help us as coaches to evaluate where to put them. Well, representative practice design definitely helps. And the other thing that I want to get your thoughts on, and you mentioned this in your notes, is, is reading gaps. Talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, certainly creating some of the, I know you mentioned some four on three advantage situations, different things like that, to be able to read gaps and play out of that. But talk to us about this process of reading gaps. What is a good gap for your player to attack? And then what are some of the decisions within those gaps? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that that we find, I'll start with this. One of the things we find is that players can be, right-handed dominant or left-handed dominant, they can come in with that. And I think part of that skill development has to be that they're comfortable going the direction that there is a gap. And and some of that is, you know, again, summer workouts are a great time to do that, to get them to work on their, their offhand or their weak hand on that. So to read gaps, I think you've got to be comfortable going either way. But again, I think that's a matter of, there's a lot, a lot of pack defenses that people play. There's a lot of denial defenses and really teach them the difference in what the gaps will be depending on what the defenses will be. But a lot of that is, is having to be done fast pace. You have to do it fast. You have to get them to read it. You have to, you know, we show a lot of film on it. We had an exhibition last night. And I think, you know, one thing we'll do is we'll show a lot of film on, you know, what was our spacing? What was the right reads and those? And, and I think visually trying to show them what they should see and what they should look for helps a great deal. You mentioned pack line, and that's a fascinating thing to talk about a little bit. Some of these defenses that pack in that don't give you some of those paint touches that maybe you value. And I've had other coaches talk to me about that. And I've said to them, well, why do you care if you get the paint touch, if you get the open shot? And that's kind of the counter to the, the, the pack line in a way is that you can create an open shot off of, say, the one dribble without getting as deep potentially, right? Right. And I mean, I think, you know, the, the one thing that you can do, too, is you can use your post player to get passes in the paint and we do a lot of screening action and cutting action. Uh, I think one of the, when you, when you spread it out and get on the perimeter, I, I think an area we've gotten better at in the last year, hopefully it'll, it'll show this year is I think we cut better. You know, if, if someone turns their head and watches the ball when it goes into the post, what are you going to do? You're going to cut and, and try to create, you can create gaps that way too, but using your post and cutting off your post and screening and, and that can also give your defense some challenges to, to how they guard you. But yes, I think if you can can get a shot, you know, the, the thing about the women's game, I, I do believe is you, the shots aren't as fast. And it's amazing watching the NBA. They shoot so far out and, you know, their, their shots are jump shot threes that, that are so quick. The women's games isn't that yet. So, you know, some of that has to be really trying to create those gaps that give you a little bit more time to get those shots off. But, you know, commitment to that too is, you know, working on, pace of your shot of catching and getting your feet down and having that on the catch. You know, that's something that I think has to be practiced too. Absolutely. I'm sure that'll change over time as well. And uh, you mentioned post play and uh, certainly actions out of the post. And that's one thing that stood out to me watching some synergy stuff of your, of your team was, and I'm curious, is it, is it conceptual once it goes in the post or are there some set actions that you prefer uh, in terms of the off the ball reactions when the ball goes in the post? Well, a lot of times if we if we pass directly into the post, we can have a couple of things. It can be a read. We need to move in some way or relocate and move. So, you know, there's times that we'll we'll set a screen for another guard and create a switch, and then you can roll the basket or you can pop. 
or it can be a pass and you do a basket cut right through, you know, and see one, if, if you can get that ball back or you can create some space for someone filling or even your post, you know, you can, you know, create a little uh, confusion there and, and maybe clip off the post defense a little bit. One of the things too, is I think if you're going to pass to the post and cut, really emphasizing trying to make that cut all the way through the lane and outside the three. I think players tend to stop once they pass and they try to jog it out. You know, if you get outside that three, then all of a sudden you're another part of the offense. You know, your, your man stays, which they tend to stay a lot of times. They tend to stay and try to help on that post. So you might be the next shooter or, or create a mismatch on the other side. Love it. It really stood out. And what's your preference on neutral then? You talked about advantage situations. What is your preference to flow into in, in when you're neutral? Well, you know, I think it really depends on, on on your personnel. I mean, obviously, ball screens can create a lot of a lot of confusion if you've got people that are that are good at it. Uh, I think I think we're better at it this year than than maybe consistently were were last year. But trying to create some things with with ball screens and you know create a, a read in that situation staggers. You know, making sure that we have some kind of screening action. You know, we we try to have a lot of different things in our package to where we could approach different teams, you know, whether it's a five man screening action or whether you bring the five up and, and, and have a five out, you know, screening and curls and, and, and fades and things like that. You know, I think it's a matter of having a really good combination of those things and putting the right personnel. I, I would love to think, you know, for many years we had UConn in the league and they were so good at everything they did, right. They were so good at, and going off ball screens and reads and things like that, you know, for, for some of us, we don't have every one of our players aren't great on those things. So trying to get the right people in those neutral situations, I think is, is crucial. Absolutely crucial in that way. And, uh, you know, in the context of spacing, you mentioned the role of the post play. I know you've also emphasized cutting. So let's maybe talk a little bit about some of the cues or some of the decisions off the ball in terms of cutting drives or different types of actions off of the drive. Well, I think, uh, you know, sometimes you can take a combination of offenses. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things in the true dribble drive concept is running behind the ball, you know, and we, we've done that for many years and kind of um, morphed our, our dribble drive into other things. And I think the thing, one thing we've discovered is that once they've kind of got those actions, you know, someone drives to the basket, that feel of going behind them, and move in kind of opposite of way the defense rotates is really becomes natural for them. So I think some of that, you know, again, that's cutting outside the three, you know, there's times that if you're loaded up on one side, we really talk about cutting the 45 and getting to the, just cutting to the basket. And then you may get something off the lift on the baseline, just, just actions like that. But yeah, you know, the nice thing is I feel like that once the, once our players start doing things, they really start looking at their defense a little bit more. Are they are they engaged in the ball? Are they engaged in the rotation? You know, is now a good time to cut? We're getting better at that. Uh, I think we have we have a couple players that are really good at it. We have some that are standers, you know, and trying to get them not to not to stand and watch what's going on. But as they get comfortable, and I think they get rewarded you know, to where they cut and they create something there, I think they realize the value of it. And that's one of the challenges of the dribble drive type of system is obviously it can become predictable in terms of where players are going. So you're giving them the freedom after understanding to be able to make their own decisions, right? Right. And I, I think that's I, I think that's important. And, you know, you, you talk about like now these days, I look back, you talk about my first years at, at Tulane, you know, the scouting situation. I mean, you, you know, people scouted you and you had all that. But as far as knowing everything you do and every tendency and all that, that just wasn't there. Right. So even even 10 years ago, it wasn't you know, what it is now. I mean, now the scouting is so detailed that the unpredictability is, I think, really important. And, you know, I, I get kidded a lot that we have a lot of sets and a lot of things like that. And I'm like, you know, we we do, but a lot of them are tweaks that go into something familiar, you know? So you might be, you know, used to be called a quick hit. You, you might run something early that goes into something familiar. I mean, that's one of the things you can do to avoid being really predictable is, is teach them how to play. And honestly, that's our commitment this summer. Our commitment this summer is not to learn an offense. Our commitment this summer has been get stronger, develop skill, and teach them how to play. 
like without an offense. And, and I think that that's really important to come in. And so we, we really didn't put an offense in until the fall. And so that part of it makes you a little more unpredictable and a little more uh, reactionary to the defense. Well, to me, if you're talking about player and team development, you're talking about exactly that situation. It's like, don't marry them to a game model until you need that and keep them conceptual because that'll make them more adaptable to play any way you want and run any set you want. So I imagine your players can pick up any set that you give them pretty well because they are conceptual players. I think so. I mean, I think they, you know, some of them I might argue with some of them, some of them don't, but I mean, I think there's always the outliers coach concepts. <laughs> if it goes into something that looks familiar. Yes. I, I definitely believe that that's the case. And again, I, I think this uh, generation of players is so visual. They, I, I think they all are very visual. So, you know, the use of film is, is, very important and showing them, you know, whether it's a little bit a day or a little, a little bit that you want to build on. Um, I think that helps them with those concepts we're talking about that they can see how they went into something that we've been working on that we've, we've kind of shown them over and over. Uh, you mentioned, you know, in your notes, some of these drills to develop the fast break and decision-making with a short clock in particular. So first of all, maybe why short clock? And then secondly, you know, show drills, Laker drills. Do you want to highlight some of these drills and kind of these concepts? Because you already mentioned, obviously, trying to get them to be able to be in situations that happen in the game. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you talk about trying to look for a good shot early and trying to find the best shot early, you know, sometimes it's, you know, we might have a, a 10 second ball screen trying to develop a, a advantage situation that's going to transition into a fast break with a 17 second clock and and might be less than that it might be 15 second clock it might be you know 7 seconds on offense going to 15 second clock so all of that is just trying to get them not to passively play and reverse the ball and do those kind of things and get a shot up and know the best shot they can get up yeah and i think they realize i think over time they they come to conclusion that we really don't have time to wait for anything to happen you know, we, I, I've got to kind of create that. So I really like that. We use our practice guys a lot uh, to where, you know, we, we kind of do it against them, you know, to where you know, we're going to, we're going to guard them and then we're going to go into something in a full court that's going to be a short shot clock and we've got to get a shot off there. And I, and that helps us a lot because it really makes you, they can't jog it. You know, they can't jog the court. They, they've got to make sure they, they, they go quickly. So again, I think that's one of those things we talk about, your first three steps, you know, how fast are you getting that ball in your first three steps? We're, we're hugging the sideline. We've emphasized that a lot this year and, you know, trying to hug that sideline and get nice and wide to where that guard has that middle third of the court. And, you know, again, you can go either side. Passing is faster. If you can get the ball at the floor with the pass, you know, do that. But so many things we do are full court. It's it's really hard to work on a fast break and work on spacing when you go at when you do a half court situation. You know, we have, you know, it's funny, we've we've had a drill for many years, a Sorrel drill that we've done. And, you know, that's really just a matter of just teaching people to run wide. And it basically you have a, a middle rebounder and you have a low line and a high line. And the, and when you outlet to the low, they're gonna get one dribble and they can pass it up cross court drop it in for a layup and the middle person has to go before the ball cannot hit. Right. But the whole idea is that you got to go down and back and down and back, you know, in a 23 second time period. And there's one dribble on each. So you're going to have your post players run the lane. You're going to have your post players get in the outlet, but it's just a matter of being able to handle under pressure under time, you know, but we have a lot of drills like that, that just, I mean, they can be conditioning drills too, but I think they're all of it. You got to handle quickly. A, a, a figure eight, simple figure eight, trying to do that in, you know, 10 seconds, you know, trying to get down and back and handle and, and take the dribbles out of it. So I think a lot of those things in summer and early time really teach them to play a little faster and be able to pass and handle under a time constraint. Love it. And just to clarify on the short clock situation, it, was it seven seconds to get into an action or is it seven seconds to get, say, into a shot? It, okay, it would be into a shot. So if it's a half court, it might be the coach enters the ball and we're going, the clock starts, you know, and that really, we probably wouldn't chart that in, mm -hmm. you know, that that's really a matter of trying to 
kind of, uh, you know, get them to think quick, that might not be your best shot because everybody's set and all that, but it's the idea of getting that shot up quick. One, the other thing it does, it helps manage practice. You don't have a lot of time on that end because you really want to get to the other end. I mean, you're really trying to get to that fast break in. So we probably wouldn't chart that as far as statistically, but we would in the full court. And, you know, then you reset it. You got seven seconds, they switch them. You do that, you go to the other end. So again, in that amount of time, you can get a lot of reps in, in a full court situation and, and work on some actions. And again, you can talk about, I think you can learn a lot about, again, where people are good, where they're the best. Are they really good in the corners? Are they really good at that 45? Are they, you know, who's good at hitting the rim run if there's a ball screen? You know, those kind of things. You learn a lot about your team in, in, a, in a degree of reps like that. I love the concept. I love the concept of obviously encouraging pace of play and and getting into stuff directly. And as you've already alluded to, trying to create that advantage and keep the advantage. So great stuff in terms of that. And then yeah, obviously pace is important. You mentioned that a lot. And obviously you just described a bunch of drills that support that. So talk to us a little bit about how you evaluate pace within practice, within a game, and how you know that you're playing with the right amount of pace. Well, you know, and again, you certainly have possessions in a game I, I mean I think that's an area that we probably really need to as a coaching staff really need to establish for the year with our personnel right now what our goals will be you know it's early in the season uh, you know I think that's one of those things is you know right now we're looking at visually where are we do and like are our point guards getting the ball and they're really pushing that ball down the floor are they kind of curling around and getting the getting the outlets, you know, right now we're kind of in that perspective, but I, I think that's as a coach, I think we've got to kind of figure out what our goals are with that. Like what are, how, how are we doing that? Are we getting down? Are we going to evaluate that on possessions? Are we going to evaluate that on how fast we're getting the ball across half court? You know, how quick the shots are coming. It, you know, are they coming in that first eight, nine, 10 seconds or are they coming later? And I think that's one of the things that you got to figure out what you want to do. And for us, I, th- I feel like we've got to kind of figure out how we want to evaluate and how we want to teach that. And then obviously all this is connected to flow. So we're trying to score as fast as possible, and then we're trying to flow. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges for pace teams is to be able to have that leg free flow from playing fast in transition to flowing into other actions. So talk to us about that, how you try and develop that lag-free feel as in flowing into secondary actions. Yeah, you know what? I think, you know, I, I spoke on this. That's why I sent it to you. I spoke to the Louisiana High School Association a, a couple of months ago on this. And I think that is a big challenge. I think that is um, an area that for us, my goal would be to get so much better in that because, you know, again, in this day and time of high level basketball, you're not going to get a lot of fast breaks. You're not, you're not getting just wide open shots all the time. That's not realistic, but you know, can, to me, sometimes pace can be getting your team kind of popping, getting them, you're getting down the court and you're moving and you're moving the ball and you kind of free, you're free. Right. So part of flow a little bit is going to be what actions do you pick to flow into? You know, there's a lot of things that aren't necessarily easy to get into off of that. And, you know, I I think we've, to this point, I think the actions we have are really easy to flow into. Now we're sitting here going, okay, well, you know, we need some zipper screens and we, you know, I think we need some, some staggers and we need, we're, we're talking about some things when we're really being pressured. So I think as we pick our actions and as we pick the things that maybe isolate some of the players that need to be isolated for us, that's gotta be a part of it. How can we go from fast break into that? Right. So I say that, that, that you have to pick those and you have to work from the fast break concept into those actions. Now we're all going to have dead balls. We're all going to have dead balls where we go over there. And that's another thing is a half court offense committing to really being good at a half court offense um, takes a lot of time. Right. So you, you definitely have to commit to that. So I think there's two things there commit to that dead ball, half court offense coming off a sideline play coming off of a, a foul into that, but also which of your actions are best going from your fast break set into those actions. Evaluating pace within those half court situations. I mean, I I think you, I think you need to, I think they're a lot harder. I think it's a lot harder because again, you're going to go up into, into different situations. You're going to go up into teams that really deny. So you may not be able to get that, that ball is easy on the wing. So you might have to have some screens to get them open. You, You know, you're going to have some different challenges there, but 
you also don't want to move that ball so much that you're using 30 seconds and then you're having a shot. Like again, last year we were really poor in that last five or six seconds shot clock. I don't think anybody's very good at that, but we were not very good at that at all. That wasn't our strength because I don't think we were used to doing that. So I think you've got to still be aggressive and have an active pace and run through those screens and run through those actions quickly to try to get a good shot earlier in the clock. So many decades in coaching coach, we got to ask, what has changed more, in your opinion, offense or defense in terms of, you know, just player style of play, whatever approach you want to approach it with? You know, I, I believe offense has, you know, certainly different personnel has changed. You know, we talk about being having more agile post players and things like that, which certainly would change the the defense. But I think offensively, it's really changed. And And again, the three point shot was a valuable thing. But, you know, people people would go inside and you're going to try to get that 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 and one inside offensively, just the skill of the of players on the perimeter has really changed. And, yeah, the skill development on the perimeter has really changed. Just a lot of different ideas have come into the game, which is great. You know, I think it's really it's really great how, you know, again, the game has evolved over the years. I think people have always talked about women's basketball being so fundamental. And they love that women's basketball is fundamental and and all that. And I think that's true. But, I, I, you know, I think at the higher levels, it's it's as good as it's ever been. You know, when you look at these really, really strong teams and look at the WNBA finals, look at look at all those. I mean, there's some just tremendous athletes there, but I mean, they are so skilled. And, you know, if you give anybody any space, they can shoot the three. If not, they're going to the rim and they find people. I, I think it's a great game now. And, you know, it's going to be interesting how it can continue to evolve. I could be wrong with this analysis, but uh, having coached girls high school basketball 25 plus years ago, too, uh, I just find that girls now are playing with much more freedom and creativity. And that comes back to the coaches not controlling them as much. And I think that used to be one of the, the enjoyments of coaches when they told me they coach girls. Oh, girls always listen. And I'm like, well, that's not necessarily a strength for right. the player. Right. That they just right. listen and do what you say. And I think your you, your comments reflect that, that the game is becoming much more free, much more creative and to to the enjoyment of the game and for the players, I'm sure, as well. I do think that you you do get you know, out of high school, depending on the high school, obviously, depending on the coaching situation. You know, I definitely think the the common sense part of the game, the the, the learning, yeah, again, learning how to play without offenses, things like that. It depends on where they come from. But I definitely think that's something that we talk about in the summer. Let's let's learn how to play basketball. Let's learn how to, you know, how are we going to pass to the post or, or those kind of things. That's a fundamental. But also when you talk about like we do some FIBA three on three, you know, we do that and and it's fast and you got to read and you got to figure it out. And I think things like that really help you learn how to play. So I, I definitely think coming from high school, sometimes you still have that challenge of getting people to play without an offense and and kind of to, to go with, to play for their skills. I want to piggyback on that because my, my daughter's 10 and 12 now, other than playing full court basketball, five on five, which obviously people know my philosophy, we do that mostly. The other thing they will request is FIBA three on three. They mm -hmm. absolutely love it. So can you yeah. talk to us a little bit more about the value of that? Because I think more coaches, especially say in North America, need to be using it more. Well, you know, I, I think it's I think it's great because it's well, first of all, it's a great conditioner, a great conditioning drill. Like people don't understand. Oh, it's three on three. We need to run the court. Oh, my gosh. You, you put that time on the clock. And, you know, again, you can use any kind of time frame you want you don't have to stay with the rules exactly how they are but you can and you can put some parameters on there you can you can change some things up but the fact that there is no stoppage of play there's no time to stop and think and you know if once the rebound is taken the, the clock starting you're playing on that short shot clock and, and once again you talk about pace you're teaching people how to play with pace in that that amount of time but i think it's a great way to get people to work together to be able to pass, to be able to, you know, you've you got to, you got a screen, you got to use screens. You, you have, everybody has to have a skill. Our team loves it. They love to play it. Now, again, they do realize how challenging it is. And, you know, during the summers and things like that, like we'll have, we'll have a tournament with our team and, and, and have a champion and those kind of things. And I, I think it just adds a different competition level without having to play a 40 minute game or a 10 minute quarter or things like that. And I, I wish more high schools would do it, honestly. I think it would really help them. And I think the kids would really enjoy it. 
hundred percent. And do you play with two teams generally, or you play with three teams and kind of rotate in and out or does we'll it vary? Play, I mean, depending on our numbers, I mean, we might have four teams, yeah. you know, we might have so you play um, at one end. Yeah. 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 We might have four teams or, or we might have two, two of them going on at a time and then we put the winners play each other and the losers, or it depends on what our, what our time frame is. But, you know, but I would say in a high school situation, you know, the nice thing is, or you could get your better players to play each other, you know, cause I know one of the things in high school, you probably just don't have that kind of depth of, of talent. And so sometimes you could put your best six against each other and they really challenged. If you do five on five, they might not be as challenged. And I, I go to practices all the time where they have, you know, maybe the varsity is playing the JV team. Well, that's not that's not as challenging as and I know why they're doing it. They want to keep their group together, but that's not the greatest challenge. But you could do something like a three on three and, and really, really get your kids to compete. Absolutely. And we've used used it especially because it maximizes time on task, active learning time, but it keeps players engaged. So they're not off. They're not like disengaged very long. They know their next rep is coming quickly, whether it's offense or defense. And it's just a way to be able to keep players going. And I'm glad you mentioned the conditioning part, which is so important too. We we don't have to run it's lines hard. to condition, do we? There's other no, ways. It's, and conditioning with a ball, I think is, is important because I mean, that's what you're going to, I mean, that's how they're going to think. And they, and I think they learn to play hard with the ball or play hard on defense, defending the ball. And as much as you can do that now, sometimes time runs out and you might have to just run some sprints to get in shape, but especially at a time of year where you don't, if you don't want to go up and down the court a lot and you, and you want to do something in, in condition. To be able to reduce the kind of full court workload and maximize right. still. Yeah, no, it's a great point. What type of shot clocks do you play with when you generally do it? You know, we've, we 10, 12, I mean, we'll go short with that again and again well uh, and one thing i want to throw in there is sometimes we'll use our practice guys with that too uh, you know and that that also when you use the practice guys with a 10 or 12 foot uh, 12 second shot clock you know that really does make them set screens and use screens a little more so but yeah i, I, I again i think that 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 just the intensity of those 10 minutes is 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 great and obviously it connects to your goal of trying to find an advantage and find an advantage as quickly as possible. And if you don't have an immediate advantage, say off the drive, then you're flowing into these different types of triggers, these different types of actions that you want to run. And it's just beautiful to be able to watch. And uh, I imagine that's an enjoyable part of practice for you and your players. It is. And, and again, I do, just like you said, I think they enjoy it. I do think they enjoy that part of it. And they, they maybe look at the game a little differently when they play that way. You probably have the numbers to do it. I don't know if you've ever tried it five on five, but we've done it that way where it's just a quick way to be able to get a ton of reps and five on five as well for coaches listening. And just again, another fun way, not wasting time, getting players engaged and be able to play. So, so much fun. Coach, talk to us a little bit about the defensive side of the ball. Talk to us about some of the philosophies that have connected for you since you've changed a little bit on the offensive side naturally and evolved over time as your players and your the game has evolved. Talk to us about defensively. Where are you at? Well, we've always run over my time here, and and, and we're still consistently doing this. We've run multiple defenses. Um, you know, we're not a team. And, and again, I, I don't think anything is wrong when it comes to defense. I think you got to go with, your philosophy and stick with that. I mean, people force baseline, people don't force base on those kind of things. You know, I think I've been in leagues where, you know, I haven't always had the fastest teams uh, compared to the rest of the league. And I'm sitting here talking about pace on a fast break. We may, we are not going to be the fastest team in our league. You know, it's just, you just trying to run. I think defensively, I think we've had to pick some different situations. I talked about the 2010 team, you know, we got out and denied and really aggressive. there, just trying to steal. And we were, 95% man to man. Most of the time we have been over the last seven years, we've been a pack line team. We really just try to try to guard the paint and try to take those opportunities away, not necessarily getting out in the passing lanes. And, and we've tried to pack it in that transfers well when you have zones. So if you're a pack line defensive team and you're also like your zone offense, a zone defenses, I think that transfers well because some of the concepts are the same. You know, you pressure the ball, you have to guard the basket, you know, you're not giving up, you're not overextended and giving up backdoor, back doors in the short corner, things like that. For us, I mean, we've played three, two, two, three. Um, we will trap out of that a little bit at times. Probably consistently zone presses if we press and that some of that is we probably have greater length than we have speed. 
So we, we've used some of that in our trapping and this year's team, this is, we've got a big team. We've got a lot of kids that uh, have really good length. So yeah, the thing I would encourage people to do is to, to kind of go with their team, to be, to, to be flexible in that is, you know, if your team, you know, it maybe is better, you know, with the wingspan and all that of playing zone defense, play that, commit to that. You know, one of our challenges, you know, just this early in the season is going to be, if we're in zone is making sure we can box out and rebound out of it. You know, that's, that's the challenge of that is, is to, to do that. I mean, I, I think we've played in, you know, again, central Florida and, and now at Georgia, I think Katie's done a great job of running that three, two zone where they just don't give up a lot of rebounds out of it. And so, you know, I, and they do a great job with that. So I think for us, we've really run a multiple system and, and we've tried to have some things in the bag when we needed them, you know, if, if it's trapping and things like that. But we we really tried to be open to to kind of putting different things in. You know, like my myself, who's coached a really long time, imagining there's not that much that you haven't tried defensively. But is there something that you haven't tried defensively? No, I don't know what that would be. For me, I've never done a one three one, just yeah. in the half court, just never done it. I never fully kind of, I, I guess, got it to the point that I wanted to use it, and uh, it was just a curious question, I guess. <laughs> We've we've used a one three one years ago, and and that was really probably when we had a lot of length. We had a lot of length, and we really I'm not saying that we used it a lot. We kind of had it to to change up. I think the great thing about something like a one three one or some kind of trapping zone is it really does change. It, it you can run it a couple possessions, and it changes kind of a momentum of a team. Even if you go back to what you had, I think that can come out and and, and change a little bit, and it's just a change up. It's hard to commit to that for a long time. You're right. Coach, I mean, so much experience, so much success. I'm curious, maybe for the veteran coaches first, do you have any advice for the veteran coaches that have been in the profession for a long time? Any type of insights or any type of advice to be able to provide for them? Well, I guess the veterans probably know, they they know as much as I do on stuff. But, you know, I I think with, I think for those of us who've been in a long time, I I think, you know, the key is to continue to adapt. And I, I started the conversation that way, but I think we're, we're adapting to different personalities of a different generation. I think there's a lot of different pressures now that from different places that maybe we didn't have earlier in our career, you know, people are less patient about winning than they used to be used to, they were committed to the, the whole process, but I, I think adapt. And, and the other thing is to enjoy the things that we're in it for, you know, even though we can see a lot of you know, there's a lot of changes when you talk about us with the NIL and, all the, and transfer portal, and all those kind of things. Those things can really suck you in to negativity at times. You know, I think the best thing to do is, you know, I still enjoy walking into practice. I still enjoy those kids. I, you know, I love sitting down and talking to them about the game. So, so pick those things you enjoy and maybe focus on those. Yeah, and that's great. And is it is it kind of people that's kept you in this so long in terms of relationships and enjoying being around your staff, your administration, your players? I mean, that's got to be such a huge part of staying in the game this long, isn't it? It is. It's definitely about the people. It's yeah. You know, I've had great coaching staffs. So I love my staff this year. I, I think working with them is really important and. You know, we we work together. It's not me working, them working for me. We work together and I, they're my team, right? Uh, I think the people are really important. Seeing the young women grow and and not only as basketball players, but as people. I mean, that's that's huge for me. And so I think that's, you got to have those other victories. It can't all be win and loss on the court. You know, it's got to be, you know, a kid's going to med school or a kid's get, getting a degree that you didn't know that, and they really had to fight to get that degree. And so I think it's those kind of things you you got to hold on and realize that we do make a difference, even though, you know, no one tells us every day. Speaking maybe to young female coaches specifically, what are some, what is some advice for them in terms of getting into the profession, staying in the profession and creating a career like you've created? You know, I, Probably the best thing is you, you're going to have to coach to your personality. You know, my, my best example of that is Pat Summit was my hero. I, she's just always been that person to me. I, I just don't, I don't have the same personality as she does. And I think there's a lot of things that I can learn from her, but I probably couldn't coach like her and stay with your personality, who, who you are. Don't try to be somebody you're not be consistent because I think players see if you're inconsistent, if one day you're, you're one way and one day the other, if we all strive to have consistent teams. So it starts with us and it starts, your staff's going to feed off of you. And, and also think your players feed off of you. And, and the other thing is, you know, it's, it's, 
maybe don't overreact when, when things go wrong or something happens. It's a, it's a journey and you've got to think of it as a long haul. You know, we talk about the season being 30 games. That's overwhelming. So whatever happens in the next five games can't, can't affect what happens in the last 20. And so, you know, take it, don't overreact, try to fix it and teach your players those skills. We talk about teaching your players skills to react to gaps and things like that. We have to give them the skills to react to adversity and, uh, and, you know, as much as you can, you know, just, just try to, to be calm and, and set the example. Coach, obviously an incredible career and, you know, so long in the game and, you know, many people have retired over the last little while in college basketball. I mean, sure, certainly Sherry Cole on the women's side, we could talk about Krzyzewski, Bayheim, all of them on the men's side. Talk to us a little bit about that process in your mind. What, what goes through your mind in terms of thinking about that next phase beyond being the head coach at Tulane? One thing I think coaches have to uh, realize, we, we feel like that we're just coaches. I, I think the skills you have in coaching, they transfer to everything. I mean, every, everything, every part of it, whether it's an advisory role or whether it's, I mean, sales or whether, whatever it is. And so I think, you know, for me, when I think about that is one of the things we talked about, why do you, what do you enjoy about coaching? I, I think that for me, my next chapter will be, I'm going to seek out those things that I really enjoy. And that's where I'm going to put my time. You know, I love this game and I love what it's evolved to. Maybe there's ways I can help. Maybe there's ways I can help young coaches. I, I don't know. Maybe I can help, help them navigate some of those things. I think that would be great. I love teaching. I, I would love to teach the next generation, whether it's in coaching or going in athletics in some way. I'd love to teach and, and, and share that because I, I do feel like I've had some great mentors in my life that have made me better. And I, I would love to have a, that opportunity to, to help someone else. Well, we'll all be better for it if you uh, move into that area and uh, help support the game and the next generation of coaches and players, Coach. So thank you so much for sharing the game with us and for all you've done within your career for the game. Well, thank you.